Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. And today I've got something really cool for you. We're going to talk about two of my favorite subjects, intellectual property law and also relationship-based business development. Now, you're thinking to yourself, Dave, why do you love intellectual property law so much? Because it's the Swiss army knife of law. Everybody needs it. If you own a business, you've got intellectual property. If you're a lawyer, your clients have intellectual property. And there's nobody better to talk about both of these subjects today than my friend Mark Hankin. So please join me in welcoming Mark Hankin to the Inside BS Show. Mark, thanks for joining me. I appreciate you being here. Great to be here today, Dave. All right, so we got to talk first about you. When you were a little baby, were you like wandering around your house, putting stickers on things going, this needs to be protected and that needs to be protected and somebody's going to take this if we don't protect it. How did you become an intellectual property attorney? I, I didn't even know that existed, Dave. When I was a kid, I was great in science. I loved science. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. So, you know, you're good in science, you're a Jewish kid growing up in New York, good in science, you're going to med school. And uh, that's all I could do. All I was doing was just heading straight for med school. Didn't know about law. We didn't really have any lawyers in our family. And I had never heard of patent law at all. So I got to, I, well, 16 years old, except in three med schools, blah, blah, blah. Get to med school, and I hate it. It's just not what I want at all. So long road from there and found intellectual property. It's like, this is great. I can use my science, but I don't have to be in the lab. I get paid like a lawyer. And I'm actually, I think I'm helping more people than I would have as a doctor. Call me yeah, sure. that's, you know, that's a, that's a really great point because intellectual property is everywhere. So there's there's a number of different paths you can go down when you become a patent attorney and you're you're a patent attorney you prosecute patents and for those people who don't know that's that means just filing patents and going through the process of seeing the patent through to either approval or final rejection and then you also do patent litigation right there are there are a host of different um areas that you could focus on tell folks what you focus on when it comes to patents first, and then we'll talk about the other intellectual property areas. Are you kind of a biological patent guy? Are you a mechanical patent guy? What is your firm known for? So Dave, in the world of law, we are really, really, really narrow. In the world of IP, we're really, really, really broad. Uh, you know, when I, when I started out as a summer associate back in the day at a firm that had started in 1895, uh, I was taken around on a tour of the floor. We had, we had one entire floor in the building. And it was divided into quadrants, and half were trademark, half were patent, half were transactional, half were litigation. And you're right, prosecution sounds like litigation, but in the intellectual property world, that means transactional work. Writing, prep, we call prep and pros, preparing and prosecuting, preparing and prosecuting a patent application. So they said to me, are you patent or trademark? Are you litigation or transaction? I thought, why do I want to be pigeonholed? That makes no sense at all. When I get in a room with a client, and I've been out of school for seven years or I went to law school. So I'd been in business. I'd had jobs. I'd worked with people. I understood how people thought. And I said, nobody's going to know the difference between a patent, a trademark, a copyright. And Dave, to this day, a lot of our provisors, colleagues, a lot of my friends, a lot of people I went to law school, a lot of lawyers don't really know the difference between a patent, a trademark, and a copyright. So I said, I don't want to be pigeonholed. So I trained myself to be cross-disciplinary. And I built Hank and Patent Law 18 and a half years ago on the concept that we're going to cross-train everybody. So we do transactional work and litigation. We do patent and trademark and copyright. And we do chemical, mechanical, electrical, pretty much if you can touch it, taste it, feel it, see it, play with it. That's the kind of thing we can protect. Do a lot of apps, a lot of software, a lot of, a lot of uh, different technologies, lasers, home theater, robotics. But at the end of the day, we are a very broad IP firm doing a lot of different things so we can help our clients when they come to us and they don't know what to ask for, but we know what to listen for. Now, one of the things I talk to my clients about and my friends who are entrepreneurs about all the time is how intellectual property can add to the value of a business, right? So, Mark, explain to people why it's so important, number one, to protect your intellectual property, and then after you protect it, number two, you got to stay on top of it because if you don't stay on top of it and somebody infringes, you might as well not have protected it in the first place. So help people understand those concepts. It's time once again for the Sandrowski Business Minute. With us today is Catherine Raker, the tax expert from Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. Okay, Catherine, what risks are associated with paying too little in taxes? 
Well, if you don't pay enough in taxes, there's a risk of underpayment penalty. And then additionally, interest on the amount of underpayment that you'd made. Depending on the nature of the underpayment, whether it was a willful underpayment or a non-willful, there could also be criminal implications. All right, folks, you heard it from the expert right here. Paying too little in your taxes can result in a knock on your door that you don't want. If you have any questions about the taxes that you're paying or the taxes you feel you shouldn't be paying, don't ask the IRS. Ask Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. You can reach them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Today's Sandrowski Business Minute. Thank you, Catherine Raker, for today's Sandrowski Business Minute. Every company you can think of is based on intellectual property with very few exceptions. Think about Google, Yahoo, Amazon. They all have technology involved. And sometimes a startup company, the only asset they have besides the hard work of their founders is their intellectual property. It is often the most valuable asset that any company has. And as a result, protecting it should be of prime importance. If you don't protect your intellectual property, you're literally leaving the doors and windows open for people to come in and steal from you all the time. So you have to protect the IP. Any company that's manufacturing and selling more widgets than somebody else, there's intellectual property in there somewhere. For example, take this. We've got a grip manufacturer. This is a grip for bicycles, motorcycles, ATVs. They've got a trademark or a, a logo they put on the end of it that helps them sell. There's a lot of technology that com connects the rubber to the plastic to the metal to keep it safe. And then it's got to stay sturdy in the rain and smog and fog and getting in the, in the mud. And, and whatever happens, I think it's got to be able to be grip for the next ride. Otherwise, the driver's in trouble. Well, that's a way you sell more products. And I've got lots and lots and lots of clients like that who have technology that drives sales of products so the company can do well. And we protect that for them. Now, talk to folks about the length of time that uh, each type of protection is good for. So let's start with let's start with copyright. Give us the layman's explanation of what a copyright is, uh, how you how you copyright something and how long that protection lasts. Sure. So. Cop the copyright application is the last bargain the United States government still gives. It's $65. It's quick and easy. They usually get your response, and pandemic has slowed it down a bit, but usually get your response three to six to nine months, typically. I had a case I had to file earlier this year where we needed to expedite it. We filed an extra expedite fee, and we got our registration certificate in one day. That's pretty good for the U.S. government. Copyright lasts life of the author plus 70 years. If it's for a corporation, it's 75 years. And it's, there's, thanks to Steamboat Willie, the original Mickey Mouse movie, there's a, uh, uh, the Disney company has been pushing it back and pushing it back. The United States Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, says to reserve to authors and inventors for a limited time the right to profit from their inventions and writings. Well, Limited time used to be 28 years, renewable once. And it's pushed back and put, or gotten longer and longer and longer. And uh, it's really now quite long because they don't want Mickey Mouse to fall into the public domain. Sonny Bono, when he was a congressman, he pushed through what was called the Bono Amendment. At this point, I'm not sure if the, copyright, if the Congress is going to push copyright longer or not. It's no longer a limited time. It's now pretty darn long. In fact, the Happy Birthday song, which was... Uh, written in the late 1800s and, and it was copyrighted, just recently fell out of uh, copyrighted into the public domain. So anyway, this, it's important to know about that. All right. Now uh, explain what trademarks are and how long the duration of protection you get from a trademark is. So trademarks in the United States, the rights come from usage over time. In other words, the longer you use it, the stronger your rights. So you don't actually have to file a registration in the United States for a trademark. It's better to. It gives the world protection. Uh, I'm sorry. It gives the world notice of your protection. Pardon me. And it lets you get certain presumptions that are worth having so you don't have to actually go ahead and prove them at trial. It basically tells everybody, hey, this is my trademark. Stay away. And honest, innocent companies will stay away. Sometimes reasonable minds differ and sometimes disputes ensue. Uh, but there are a lot of trademarks out there, and um, it's worth doing. Trademark application is still relatively inexpensive, $250, not very expensive. Uh, it used to be 
before pandemic, three months and one week. You could set your calendar by it. And not actually because of the pandemic, because the trademark examining attorneys were working remotely for a long time before this, but because the Chinese government and Chinese companies have been bombarding the U.S. Trademark Office with fraudulent trademark applications. The trademark office no longer takes three months in a week. It's now taking between six, seven, eight, sometimes nine months for the initial determination to get back to you. They are so overwhelmed. And the trademark commissioner has been canceling fraudulent trademark applications by the tens of thousands, just not fast enough. So there's a huge delay now, but eventually, typically within about a year, year and a half, we can get you a registered trademark and you go from there. And when it comes to trademarks, there are uh, there, there may be questions or there are um, exclusions that come back, and those are called office actions. Explain to people what that means, because I know a lot of people, when they file a trademark application, they say, oh, you know, I, I filed this application and we're, you know, we're all set, and it's far from all set. Right, or they use some service like LegalZoom or, you know, just right. remember, you get what you pay for. Uh, legal right. zooms owned by lawyers, but they're not lawyers, and they don't provide legal advice. The bottom line is that uh, if you get a real trademark attorney to work with you, and they file the trademark application, ninety-nine or nine hundred ninety-nine out of a thousand times, they know what they're doing, and they are filing something intending it to go through. Every once in a while, there's some trademarks that get filed, and I wonder why. But in any event, oh, the great majority of the time. And every so often, the trademark office will push back with something a little crazy. Uh, sometimes it's legitimate. Oftentimes, it's just silly. Remember, the trademark examining attorneys, some of them are 20, 30, 40-year veterans of law. That's all they've ever done. They're brilliant and wonderful and know way more about trademarks than I ever will. And some of them are one or two years out of law school, and they really don't have the experience of seeing these things. And to be honest, sometimes they make innocent mistakes. Um, I, I've had some crazy office actions over the years, but the bottom line is that I think the trademark office is doing its best to get people their trademarks on a reasonable time period and help people move forward to protect their rights. Now, Mark, I like to talk about, I, I love I love talking about trademarks. And one of the things I like to talk about with clients when it comes to trademarks, like clients who are not lawyers, clients who are entrepreneurs, is the more original your uh, your the mark, the thing that you want to protect is, the better off you are. However, from a marketing standpoint, sometimes that can be tough because, like, if it's a word in common usage, they're not going to let you protect a word in common usage unless it's in a very very narrow space. However, if you make up a word like Verizon then you've got a better shot at, at getting the mark protected. Explain to folks why that is. Well, there's a sliding scale. Okay, so a, a, a merely descriptive mark is not protectable. A generic mark is not protectable. Merely descriptive, not protectable. Descriptive with what they call secondary meaning might be. If you can show that people recognize the trademark for what it is, which we can get in way more detail, but we're not going to on this podcast, then you could get it protected. Suggestive trademarks probably are protectable given most circumstances. Uh, where you really want to be is the other end of the spectrum, the, ar the arbitrary or fanciful trademarks. You know, words that are made up like Yahoo, Kodak, uh, Verizon, you mentioned, th those are, are relatively safe from a trademark standpoint because the whole point of them is that they don't really mean anything in any language. For example, provisors. Now, we think of professional advisors and it's a little bit like a contraction, but provisors is not a word in any language and is probably very well protectable. But, you know, if you talk about United Van Lines or United Airlines, those are, are less protectable. However, both of those companies have long, continuous, and strong use, spend a lot of money on advertising, and nobody ever went to the airport to move their house. And nobody ever called United Van Lines to fly from here to Boston. So they've, they've actually succeeded in making what was a relatively suggestive trademark into a very, into a very strong brand. And now you file for protection and you're, everything goes through. You have Mark do it for you. Everything goes through. He takes care of everything. And then you have to, there, there are certain things you have to keep up with, right? And I'm sure you guys dock at that to make sure that your, your clients keep up with it. Explain that to folks. So I think you're talking about renewals and trademarks right. have to be renewed in the United States after five years, another five years, so that's 10 years, and then 20, 30, 40. So it's five, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. And frankly, 
As long as you keep renewing it, that trademark can stay alive literally forever. The beautiful thing about trademarks as opposed to copyright and patent, remember, copyright and patent limited time, trademarks are a judge-created uh, right and uh, through a trio of cases, the trademark cases, and trademarks can go on forever and ever and ever so long as you comply with the, with the regulations and keep them alive and pay the government your renewal fee. Right. All right. Now, now let's talk about patents. Okay. Sure. So this is, this is really the most, in my opinion, the most complicated in the opinion of a guy who knows nothing about the law, this is the most complicated, right? Explain what protections a patent affords you and explain what can be patented. All right. Let's break it down really quickly. Four kinds of patents, land patents. We don't care about them. We're not going to talk about land patents, plant patents. They protect the asexual reproduction of plants. Dave, I don't think you or I want to spend a lot of time on something that's asexual, right? So we don't need to worry about those. But that is in I mean, the world this of... This is a, a, couple, a couple of guys who've been married a very long time. I think, <laughs> I think we're pretty much <laughs> over that. Yeah. yeah, let's not go there. But in the, world, in the world of cannabis, all of a sudden, plant patents are becoming common again or, or, or useful again. They were really big with roses and tulips and that sort of thing. In any event, uh, so plant patents. The other two kinds of patents, the main two kinds of patents that my clients care about are design patents and utility patents. We're going to break down utility patents a little further, but let me just dismiss design patents quickly. I showed you this, this uh, grip before. So the different as aesthetic aspects of it, right? The aesthetic aspects of an otherwise functional product, that's what can be protected. Think about your iPhone and the curvature of an iPhone. You've got the rounded curves and whatnot. Um, all those things, those are things that could be done differently, but because of the way that they're structured out of a series of choices and they acquire secondary meaning, they can be protected. And those can be design patent. They also actually could be a form of trademark called trade dress. But again, there's some fine line distinctions way beyond the scope of this podcast. So design patent, there you go. Utility patent comes in two kinds. There's a utility patent on a product and a utility patent on a process. And of course, those are different. So product is a new thing, okay? A new article of manufacture, something, you know, a stapler, a car, a, a hinge, you know, something that's a thing. And a process is a method. Um, it could be a method of, of, of doing a lot of different things. For a while, business method patents were protectable and no longer really are in the United States. Uh, that's the, the one-click, double-click, you know, all these sorts of internet-based things, uh, those are really not protectable anymore in the United States. The, the government tried a 35-year experiment that I think failed. But in any event, you can still protect processes and, and methods for lots of lots of things, just not that. Um, and, and utility patent protects how it's done. Whether it's a process or a product, you have certain steps that you go through. And it's either a, a method steps or a steps of making some article of manufacture. To be, become patentable, it has to be new, useful and not obvious. If it can be new, useful, and not obvious, it can be protected. And then we have to explain to the government what salute, what problem we're solving, how other people tried to solve that problem but failed, why this solution is more elegant, less expensive, more a better fit, whatever it is. And then the patent, the government will allow us to get a patent for our client, and that gives them a period of exclusivity. Remember that patents and trademarks are negative rights. In other words, they don't give you the right to do anything. They give you the right to stop other people. In a patent, it's making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the patented product or process. And so getting that negative right allows you to keep others from coming too close to you. Okay, and how long is that and when does the clock start? Does the clock start when you file or does the clock start when you get the actual paper in your hand? Everybody's heard the term patent pending. Patent pending means I have filed an actual patent application with the United States Patent Office, and it has neither been allowed and issued as a patent, fully rejected with no more appeals, gone abandoned, or I, I discontinued it and can no longer pro prosecute it. While the patent application is pending, or any continuations, or anything you keep going, you may say patent pending. That gives you a bunch of rights. First, it puts the world on notice that you claim patent rights. Second, it allows you to, uh, if you get a published patent application and you send that to somebody that you think is infringing it, and then eventually you get a patent issued 
that has claims that are substantially similar to the claims in the published patent application that you sent to the person, you can actually get monetary damages back before the patent issued. Dave, I don't know if you know this, but patents issue on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday, even if it's Christmas right. or New Year's, it doesn't matter. On Tuesdays, patents issue. So when a patent issue is on a Tuesday, you can file that day a complaint and get it in, or you could seek an injunction, maybe file for a temporary restraining order, whatever it is. And you get normally you get damages going forward from the date of filing. But with a published patent application where you gave actual notice and the patent is substantially similar, you now can get damages going backwards. Okay? Putting aside the notice of the published patent application, when the patent is granted and you pay the issue fee, the first of multiple taxes, well, the second, the first is the filing fee, then the issue fee. When you pay your issue fee and the patent issues on a Tuesday, you now have a patent that is in full force in effect. You have to pay three more taxes, or what they call maintenance fees, to keep that patent alive. It's basically the fourth, eighth, and twelfth year after the patent issues. We talked about three and a half, seven and a half, eleven and a half, but again, way more detail for this pod than this podcast. But basically, at the four, eight, and twelve years, remember we talked about trademarks five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty. Patents are at the time of filing, at the time of issuance, and then four, eight, and 12 years after. But in 1995, June 8th to be exact, I never thought of that before my my son's birthday. Uh, But June 8th, 1995, he was born in 2002, so that's why I didn't think of it. Uh, But anyway, but uh, starting then, under President Clinton, the United States switched from keeping patent applications confidential forever until the patent issues to publishing them after 18 months. So unless you do a non-publication request, which is a very specific thing that most people don't do for good reason, unless you do a non-publication request, in 18 months from the earliest priority date, your application will be published. 20 years from that earliest priority date, your patent will expire. It doesn't matter how many patents you get. It doesn't matter what, whether, what it is. It'll expire from the uh, design patents, by the way, now 15 years from date of issuance, not date of filing. But utility patents, we're talking about 20 years from the earliest priority date. It used to be 17 years from date of issuance. And back in 1995, they actually thought that was making it better for inventors because the average pendency of an application was less than three years. In fact, under first President Bush, it was 19 months on average from date of filing to date of first office action. Now it's well over 42 months on average. Mm. It's not been a good... Yeah, it's not been right. So they initially thought they were giving more than 17 years. In practice, it's turned out that almost every patent gets less than 17 years because it's 20 years from date of filing, and that prosecution period normally takes longer than three years in most circumstances. Now, explain to people, the the final thing that that I want to touch on when it comes to this is explain to people about trade secrets and the difficult decisions some people have to make about filing for a for patent protection, or keeping something as a trade secret? There's, we talked about the sliding scale of trademarks, right? So there's a sliding scale of patent or of inventions as well. And at one end is the patent application. We want to file a patent application to get government protection. The other end is a trade secret. The other end of the continuum, we don't tell anybody. The patent grant, and we didn't really talk about what it is. We said what it allows you to protect other people from doing. But it's basically a bargain with the government. Teach us your technology. Teach us your invention. And in exchange, we'll give you this period of exclusivity where you can stop others from making, using, selling, offering for sale or importing. That's the bargain with the government. You show us your best mode. You tell us everything you know about it. Because like Sir Isaac Newton said, if I can see farther, it's only because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, technologies move forward by each of us teaching one another. We want inventions to be taught so others in academia and in industry can take them and learn from them and better them and and, and make new and improved inventions. The other side of that is trade secrets. We're not going to tell anybody. We're going to keep it a secret. We're not going to let anybody know. We're going to put controls in place. And I have a whole checklist I give my clients about. Here's all the things you need to do to make a trade secret. For example, you have to have passwords. You have to have auto lock on your computer. So if you walk away from the screen, nobody can come up and, you know, like you see on TV, they go in there, they stick the the flash drive in and they copy everything because somebody didn't lock their computer. You know, you have better passwords. You have to have things, non-disclosure agreements. You have to have, have people check in. Don't let the salesman come walking through your manufacturing plant to get to the conference room in the back. Put the conference room up front so the salespeople don't go through there. 
There's a lot of things you need to do to protect the trade secret because if you tell anybody, it's no longer a secret. But if you can keep that secret secret, then it's actually pretty strong protection and lasts much longer than patents. Remember, limited time, trademarks, and copyrights. Trades, trademarks, unlimited time as long as you do what you have to do. Trade secrets, unlimited time. Let's talk about the two most famous trade secrets that I'm aware of. Formula for Coca-Cola, right? It's known by only two people. It's in a vault in, in you know, Atlanta, Georgia. Nah, nah, nah. Or the Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe. Right? All those herbs and spices, that secret blend that Colonel Sanders put together, nobody knows about it. It's a trade secret. So only those who have a need to know, and you can keep that forever, as long as you keep it secret. The problem is, once it's revealed to the public, then it's gone. You can sue on that, but, you know, good luck. One of the things I love about intellectual property is if you've protected it and you're monitoring it, you now have the ability to build equity in your company separate and apart from what the bricks and mortar is of your company. That's one thing I love about it. The other thing I love about it is if you want to operate someplace else, but you don't want to build your company someplace else, you can license some or all of your intellectual property to other people. Mark, explain how that works. Explain how you can license something that is not like a, you know, a tangible physical thing that's just intellectual property. I've drafted, negotiated, executed well more than 500 licenses, testified as an expert witness more than half a dozen times. Licensing is complicated, but at, at its heart, it's very simple. That which can be protected, let's say by patent, for example, if you do it and you're not the patentee, that's called infringement. If I, the patentee, let you do it, that's giving you a license. So if I license you to do something, it's the same steps that would be infringement, but now are blessed because we have a written agreement that allows you to do that. Now, there's other kinds of licenses. Sometimes there's an implied license. There's the for sale doctrine. There's a lot of non-licensed licenses. We can get into those at a later time. But let's talk about a basic license agreement. There are a number of factors, and they are all negotiable. Every single one of them is negotiable. I was just reading about Burt Cohen, the, uh, the guy who came up, who pulled the win-win out of the gaming world and talked about it in the negotiation and uh, kind of a famous, famous uh, uh, negotiator. When you have a license, you, have, you can have, may have, and all these things I say are optional, an upfront license fee. It's negotiable, but you can have an upfront license fee. You can have a running royalty, and that might be a certain dollar amount per product, might be a certain percentage of revenue, could be on net sales, gross sales, it could be a lot of different things, it could be by time period, but an upfront payment, a running, a running royalty. Okay? You can have a guaranteed minimum. Sometimes that's a guaranteed annual minimum. Sometimes it's quarterly, sometimes it's monthly. You get a payments of the royalties, monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it is. Um, and there's other bells and whistles and tricks to a license agreement. But basically, you have the money you pay up front, the money you pay over time, the guaranteed minimum, and then a lot of other, sometimes lawyers call it boilerplate, but here's the thing I always train junior associates. Never, ever, ever accept the boilerplate. Rethink everything, look through it, make sure it actually applies to your situation. But there's a lot of details that go into a license that may or may not work best for your company, depending in part whether you're the licensor, that means the one with the rights, or the licensee, that means the one getting the rights, depending whether you have strength in either of those situations, and depending on you know what sorts of niceties you care about. And again, it's all negotiable, and frankly, the whole thing operates as one big organism where you might give here, push there, do a little horse trading, you know, etc. But at the end of the day, come up with a license that both sides can live with. And then you can go ahead and practice the patent or the technology or use the trademark or use the trade secret, whatever it is, what otherwise would be an infringement because you now have permission, that is to say you have a license. All right. All that is great. Thank you so much for sharing that fantastic information with us. Let's talk a little bit about litigation. And one of the things that always strikes me when it comes to particularly the area of patents is a firm doesn't have to be big in order to be a giant in the litigation space when it comes to patent law. And the example that I give to people all the time is I had a client that was, uh, let me see if I can try to, well, it's, it's public knowledge. That it was the Home Depot Sa Sawguard case. My client went into, uh, went into court and tried to 
um, tried to practice patent litigation when they were fantastic, co complex commercial litigators, and they got their heads handed to them. <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't know what they were doing when it came to patent law. So what did they do for the appeal? They went out and they found uh, a firm much like yours, a, uh, a, a boutique law firm with that specialized in patent litigation. These, these folks spent all day and all night li living, breathing patent litigation. And they had the patent litigators come in and basically take over the case and show them what they did wrong and help them find the areas for appeal that could potentially work. Now, listen, they didn't prevail because they just got their heads handed to them and there was there was no there was no reversible error that was made. However, had they brought the patent firm in in the first place, they would have had a better chance. Mark, explain to folks why it's so important if you have a patent litigation matter that you hire a patent litigation firm and why it doesn't matter what size the firm is. It just matters the depth of their experience and knowledge. Dave, nothing makes me more happy or tell my client more confident predictions than when I get a general litigator on the other side, oh, I can litigate anything. I'm a really, oh, patents, I understand those. Because patents are not easy to understand. And even somebody who's litigated patents for years or decades if they're not a registered patent attorney, they don't really understand the way the patent world works. They may think they do, and I love it because I'll run circles around those people. I go up against the big firms on a regular basis, and you know, since 98.6% of all cases settle, I can't say that I, quote, win, but let's just put it that I get a great settlement for my client most of the time, almost all the time. I've lost once or twice, sure, but most of the time... I'm David to somebody else's Goliath, and my client, who has less money to spend than the other side, will we will outthink them, because we can't outspend them, and get around and figure it out. When you go into litigation, there are highly specific rules, and you have to follow them. There's a lot of thing, a lot of complexity. In fact, uh, many of the larger district courts that have more patent cases have what they call patent pilot project judges, or you know, judges that they're not patent lawyers unfortunately, sadly. But they are judges that have had a more than their fair share number of patent cases. And they are not afraid of them. They enjoy them. They understand the way it works. And they get in there and they apply rules and, and, and procedures. And the litigators that come in front of them who really understand patents come in and litigate over it in a way that's more and better than just general litigation. Because general litigators may or may not understand all the nuances of exactly what's going on with the patent. But there's a lot of things that can go right and can go wrong in the patent office and the prosecution, right? That's the, the transactional process of getting the patent that can come up to bite them in litigation. So there's nothing that makes me happier than going up against a general litigator and seeing how we can beat them at, the, at that game. But yeah, the bottom line is to do patent litigation, you should hire somebody who's highly trained, who's skilled, who's a registered patent attorney. And at least in a firm, if you, if you want to have general litigators, that's fine as long as there's some registered patent attorneys on the team who understand what they're doing and, and know how to know their way around a patent file history. That's the back and forth uh, correspondence between the inventor and the patent examiner. You, you have to understand what you're arguing about. I mean, it's that's just it's common sense. You, you don't the nuance, Dave. It's it's, yeah. it's not just getting the basics. It's getting the real nitty gritty details. All right, let's let's shift gears now. I want to talk about you, so you uh, you're you were an East Coast kid growing up, right? You sure. you went to you went to Boston University, and then you went to Iona, and then you went to the University of Pennsylvania. How did you wind up on the West Coast? <laughs> Met a girl. <laughs> ah, there it is. Okay. So right after school, then you moved out to the West Coast and you hung your shingle in California. Or did you did you start out there as a practicing as a lawyer, or did you start out on the East Coast and then go to the, then go to the West Coast? So my dad and her dad were members of the same business organization, YPO, and then graduates. Some some of the graduates of YPO, Young Presidents Organization, are invited to join CEO, which is sort of uber elite people. And uh, it was basically an arranged marriage, right? I mean, they knew each other from coast to coast. And uh, we went to a family convention and um, we met each other. And I was a second year law student and was about to get a clerkship to keep me in New York yet another year. And she decided she was going to turn down Columbia Business School to go to UCLA Business School. So we guaranteed we'd be apart for another year. 
But in any event, we stuck with it, and three kids, three houses, and uh, 31 years later, we're still here, still married, and um, I'm living out in L.A. second half of my life, so it's pretty good. But, oh, that's um, great. Yeah, but I love the East Coast. I went, lived up and down, as you pointed out, Boston, New York, Philadelphia. I actually grew up in Maryland for six years, but... Um, but I've been in I've been out here in Los Angeles for thirty years and I ain't going back. I've been looking at the weather. We're going to Florida this weekend. I've been looking at the weather forecast. Everybody's got a heat wave going on right now. New York, Washington, Atlanta, Florida, and it's raining. And out here it's like high sixties, low seventies, light breeze, beautiful weather. I'm not moving, Dave. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how you grow your business because that's how we met. So talk about the the way that you started growing your business and what got you into uh, the the organization that you and I are part of that that we met within. And that's Provisors. Did you did you start out as somebody who was was a people person and networking was an, always an important part of your business development activity, or is it something that you grew into? First time I was asked to join a networking group, I turned them down telling them that I don't have to pay for sex. I don't pay for networking. I have a great network. I went to an Ivy League law school. I've got a lot of friends and colleagues, and I know people all over, and I've worked at a bunch of different firms. And I have a great network. I don't need to pay for networking. Many years later, somebody convinced me to join BNI, and I did. I was in BNI two years, biggest networking group in the world. And I learned a lot. I learned how to stand up and speak in front of a room. I was a good public speaker, but standing up in a networking group where you get 30 or 60 seconds is a whole different skill set than giving a prepared speech where you tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Very different skill set. Um, I got a tagline, protect what you have in mind. And I learned a lot about networking in the two years I was in BNI, but it wasn't the right periscope level for my practice. It was more lotions and potions. Um, I still have my dentist from BNI, I still have my massage therapist, I've given up my electrician, my plumber, my insurance guy. But I was turned on to what was PNG, Professional Networking Group, the still the business name of Provisors, still the actual corporate name. Um, and I joined PNG slash Provisors early 2007. And you know, Dave, I vetted the group because of the, I was in a wonderful BNI group with great people, but didn't get a lot of business. I wanted to join a group where I would really get a lot of business. And I spent four months, I went to eight groups, I vetted a lot of different groups, and I joined a group that I thought was the right fit for me. Fifteen years later, I tell everybody, do not look for a group where you can get business. Look for a group where you can give referrals. Find a group where you can come in and bring value. Lesson learned. But I did join, and in the first year, I did not get a single paid referral. Because you know what, Dave? They already had their Rolodex. They already had their network. They weren't waiting for me to come along. Hey, here I am. Give me all your work. It doesn't work that way, Dave. People do business with people they like. That's why Provisor's motto, their trademark, know, like, trust, refer, that is not just a, a, a thing we roll off our tongues. It's a process. You and I have gotten to know each other. You and I have been together on the dance floor in Chicago. You and I have hung out, right? We, we've been online. We've been in meetings together. We've gotten to know each other. And I, I hope you're not going to contradict me right here on the air, but I dare say we like each other. I certainly like you, and I've come to like you over time as we've gotten to know each other better. Whenever I see the godfather of growth, it makes me happy. <laughs> I enjoy seeing you. I would actually go out of my way to be with you and go out of my way to do something for you. And that all leads to trust. And then eventually you get to refer to each other. And you've already actually referred me to some, some other people who are great connections for me. At the end of the day, we do business with people we like. We do business with people that we trust and that we can make referrals to. And it is a relationship-based organization. It's not hunting. It's farming. It's planting seeds. It's watering. It's fertilizing. It's growing over time. And yes, Dave, it's pruning. It's making sure that that grows really strong. And I can tell you, I won't hear now, but I can tell you some nine and 10 year sales cycles, not one, not two. This happens somewhat regularly. Yes, people do get business in a couple of months. Yes, people do get business in a year or two. But I've seen it personally where I both have been the giver and the receiver, where the sales cycle took eight or nine or 10 years of knowing somebody, really getting to know them, really getting to like them, really getting to trust them, and then that right matter came along that maybe put a quarter of a million, half a million, million dollars in their pocket. And I have multiple stories like that because that's the way the world works. 
You know, I so, learned networking. Go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to say, I learned networking from my dad. My dad died a few years ago, but he was 47 years a college president. And when I was six years old, he came home, he had a badge, and he showed me, you put your badge on the right side so when you shake, it faces. When people put it on the left, it faces away, you can't see it. When I was either seven or eight, I don't remember now, he took me to my first rotary meeting. One day when I was in, in late elementary school or junior high, I don't remember exactly, I was sitting in my dad's office after school waiting for, we were going to go to dinner, and he had a problem. His college had lost some funding unexpectedly. My dad got on the phone, he worked the phones, and back in the mid-70s, he raised $6 million in an afternoon. Now, that was real money back then. Yeah, and he great. did that by calling people he knew, that he knew personally, that liked him and trusted him. My dad used to send out articles to me. We had these little slips from the desk of Joseph N. Hankin. Thought you might find this of interest. And then he would just sign Joe and put it with an article and the secretary would send it out. These days I do that with emails. But I learned so much from my dad about how to network. He never said, I'm going to teach you how to network, son. He just showed me by example, this is how you treat people. This is how you get people to like you. This is how you get people to remember you. How you get people to keep you top of mind. And when you need $6 million, they'll take your phone call. And I got to tell you, I have prospered, thank goodness, because of the friends I have made and the people that I love and the people that I know love me and that trust me. And it's not rocket science. It's just treating people really well. It's like Maya Angelou always said, some people are going to forget what you said. Some people are going to forget what you did, but no one's ever going to forget how you made them feel. No, I, I completely agree with you. We're 100% on the same page. Let's let's get into uh, a few specifics because there are the people who are going to listen to this who, are, who will watch this who are part of Provisors. And one of the things that strikes me, look, I you've been doing this for 16 plus years longer than me in Provisors. But one of the things that strikes me all the time and everybody that I refer, my clients who I encourage to become members of Provisors, I tell them this. If you're just going to go, you join a group and it's, it's called your home group. And if you're just going to go to that one meeting every month, you're not getting the full benefit, the full value that this organization has to offer. So share with people what you do so that you can get in front of even more people, as many people as you possibly can on a regular basis. And 16 years plus in, you're still doing this. Explain what you do. Some of, them, some of us call them bagel munchers. <laughs> if you come to the meeting for breakfast, if you come to the meeting just to be there, and Dave, I see this over and over again. I see it on Zoom. I see it in person. Somebody shows up at seven a.m. for the previous, you know, the prior half hour. They're not. They're not the ones who are popping in at seven twenty-nine and a half. They're there early, and they sit there, and then they're there for the meeting from seven thirty to nine a.m. Or if it's a lunchtime meeting, eleven thirty a.m., one thirty p.m. They're there for the whole time. They don't come late. They don't leave early. They're nice people. And honestly, at 9.01, you don't remember they were there. You don't remember why they came. They never said a word. They never helped anybody. Nobody ever thanked them. They didn't volunteer. They didn't run the social. They didn't make the announcement. They're not a group leader. They're not on the executive committee. They're literally there to munch a bagel. And they think that that's networking. These are the people who come to networking events and give out business cards. And they think that the more business cards they give out, the better they're going to do. Nobody, nobody cares about giving out business cards. Although i got a great story for some other time about business cards. But the point is that you have to come to the meeting prepared to give. You, have to come. you may not have a client who needs to hire somebody. You may have a connection. But don't, do, don't be one of those people. And there are some improvisers. Oh, you two should meet. I have more of that in B&I. But you two should meet. Why should we meet? What's the point? No, there has to be a real purpose to the connection. But there should be a real purpose. And sometimes when there is, it can provide more revenue downstream than any one client, even that million-dollar client. Because a great connection to somebody you can be friends with and colleagues with and, and, and refer back and forth with over the course of the rest of your career is worth way more than any one client. And yet some people, improvisers, forget to thank others for making those connections. At the end of the day, what you want to do is you want to come in looking for finding ways to help people. Find ways to provide some legal advice or some coaching advice or whatever it is that you do, help people with the questions they have. 
You and I had a conversation recently about my business, which is going great, but I had some questions for you because you're a wonderful advisor. You advise lawyers all over the country on how to build their businesses, and I had a question that I thought maybe you could answer, and you spent a lot of time with me answering those questions with me. That's the kind of thing, Dave, that comes back in spades because I will never forget that you took care of me when I was in a time of need. And I've given free legal advice, free intellectual property advice to many, many, many people and providers. I call it the Trader Joe's theory. You give them a little taste. If they like it, they come back and buy the whole package. And that is giving. Making a meaningful connection, that is giving. Yes, referring a client that has a need for your skills and services, that's also giving. But any and all of those things are ways for you to get to be better known in the group. Because if the person that receives is worth anything, they will give you a testimonial and make you look good in a future meeting. Maybe they'll follow you around and give you a couple different test or the same testimonial a couple different times in different groups and make you look good in front of other audiences. Because that is how we know, hey, Dave Lorenzo's a guy I can do business with. Dave Lorenzo's a guy I can work with. Right? We, we, we don't know when we see all these professionals. Some of them are dressed better than others. Some of them wear Hawaiian shirts, for gosh sake. And you know what? At the end of the day, we don't know what that means. But when we hear somebody getting five or six testimonials every single meeting, when we hear somebody giving testimonials repeatedly and thanking people and showing the connections that they make, well, that's why they call it the currency of provisors. That's why we understand that we're not giving each other referral fees. We're giving each other thank. We're making people look good in front of the home room. And when you come to your home group and somebody makes you look good, a guest who's there for the first or second time and sees and hears you being thanked repeatedly by the other members, they're going to want to request to sit down with you. They're going to want to get to know you. And nothing builds business better than somebody wanting to get to know you because they're going to find ways to throw business at your feet. And Dave, it's better than... <laughs> It's better than panties and Tom Jones on screen. People will <laughs> literally throw their business at you if only they think they'll get a great testimonial out of you. So here's, you know, this is something that people need to take away from from this if they're if if they get anything at all out of this, and that's everybody talks about the same dozen people improvisers over and over and over again. There are seven thousand members improvisers, seven thousand. Everybody talks, whatever. Everybody talks about the same, plus or minus. Everybody talks about the same 12, 15 people, no matter where you go, if you're at a social event, if you're at uh, just a handful of people getting together, the same names come up. Why is that? It's because those people are doing what you're talking about. So if you're, even if you're the, the greatest person in the world in your home group and you're constantly passing referrals to the 35 people in your home group, you're going to have a great reputation with those 35 people. Now, talk to, talk to the folks who are listening and watching, Mark, about stepping outside of your home group and visiting maybe one new group a week or one group three times over the course of six months. Talk about how you can really maximize the value of being a member of Provisors because you're you're 16 plus years in as we record this and you're still visiting a ton of groups all the time. Explain the value of doing that. Dave, there's directories out there. And honestly, there's lots of good lawyers. There's lots of good coaches. There's lots of good CPAs and insurance brokers and everything else. And once somebody goes to the directory, there's a pretty good chance someone else is going to get the work. You need to stay top of mind. You need to stay in front of people. You have to go. You can't go once to a group. You have to go three times within six months. I, I like three out of four for me. I call it January, February, April. Go twice, skip a month, and go the fourth month. But whatever it is you do, go and let people get to know you. And show up. Don't just be there. Don't just be a bagel muncher. Show up. Bring gifts. I'm not talking about bottles of wine and baskets of fruit. Bring connections, bring referrals, bring your advice, bring tips about, hey, here's a great, uh, we talked about home groups, affinity groups, which are a benefit of Provisors membership, means you can go, there's lawyers groups, women's groups, not-for-profit groups, LGBTQ plus allies affinity group, coaches and consultants group up in Boston, I hope you go to that one on the fourth Wednesday, there's non-profit groups, there's all kinds of affinity groups. Branding, licensing, intellectual property, which I helped to start with one of my members who's the group leader, Harold Weitzberg. Those affinity groups are where a lot of business gets done. 
But you might suggest to somebody who's new, hey, here's an affinity group. Maybe you didn't know we had a healthcare affinity group. Maybe you didn't know we had two international affinity groups. And by the way, a home group that used to be called Global, now called Los Angeles, downtown, downtown Los Angeles 5. The bottom line is tipping people off to those things is bringing value. And so come to the group to bring value. But Dave, it takes time. It takes time. It takes time to go along that continuum from no to like to trust. So as you go to guests and get to know people, make sure you go, we call it a troika, when three people get together for coffee or lunch or whatever afterwards, wine tasting, skiing, hiking, book clubs. I know people go on scuba diving. Um, but go-kart racing, real car racing. Uh, the idea is get together with people after the, so the big business meeting. The big business meeting, that's the menu. You see who you want to get to know. The troika, that's the deep. That's where you get to really know people on a personal level. Where'd you grow up? What's your family like? What, what's your hobbies outside of work? You know, what kinds of things, what kind of wine do you like to drink? What kind of food do you like to eat? What kind of ball do you like to play? What kind of shows do you like to go to? What kind of books do you like? All that stuff. And at the end of the day, again, it's just trying to take the small amount of networking time that the organization provides as a minimum and expand it into more time because the more number of touches we have with people, the more that we can stay top of mind, the better we can be rememberable, memorable, then the more stickiness there is for that referral to come our way. The whole key is to tell good stories. Tell us a story that gives us visual imagery and will stick in our minds that next time we hear a similar situation, you will pop into our brain and we'll, be it. we'll know exactly to whom to make the referral. We won't have to go to the directory. We won't have to look for somebody else because we'll, we'll be thinking of you. And that's the best way to get it to work. Yeah, there's two more things about, about this that I want to that I want to drill down with you. Only on. two? Uh, no, yeah, well, I don't want to I don't want to take up your entire day. So the 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 second to last thing that I want to talk about is something that I found to be I guess I expected it, but it's really the hidden value of provisors is me having now an entire army of people that I can connect my clients to when they have an issue. That makes me more valuable to my clients. So I'm in the first year of my membership at Provisors, and if I don't get a stitch of business, this is worth the membership fee alone because now people call me for every single professional service issue they have all over the United States, and I've got somebody who's going to take my call. I can explain the matter to them, and they're going to take my client's call, and my client is always going to remember that I did that. They're never going to leave me. This is something that when people are telling you about provisors, they do not highlight enough. You now have an entire army of people at your service waiting to help your clients. The people who are your competitors, they don't have that. So Mark, explain to people how valuable that has been for you. All right, first of all, the good news and the bad news is I have learned over the last decade and a half the tipping point's about two and a half years. Yeah, you might get business in your second year. You might. But it's that between second and third year where you've already been coming. You've been spending your time going to meetings. You've gone to Troikas. You've gone to socials. You've gone to fitting groups. People start to get to know you're not going anywhere. You've renewed twice. Then they can start to trust you and refer to you. And that's like a snowball at the top of the hill starts rolling down and picking up weight and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm telling you, when it tips over the edge, Dave, that's when the work starts flooding in. So stick with it. You're only in your first year. All right. Second of all, I used to be the assistant group leader for my first group that I joined. I told you I spent four months vetting eight groups. And the group that I joined, I was interviewing the hiring partner for Latham & Watkins, which at the time was one of the largest law firms in the world. Probably still is, but not as... Not, anyway, that guy, I said, you know what? I'm sorry, but people are not going to be having many referrals for Latham & Watkins. I know I'm not. And I just don't really know if this is going to be a good fit for you. He looked at me. He said, Mark, you have it all wrong. I'm not looking to get business. I'm here to find resources. Sometimes my clients can't afford Latham & Watkins and need a lawyer that is a little less expensive. Sometimes they need disciplines that we don't have. And also they need accountants and insurance brokers and realtors and bankers and lots of things that Latham & Watkins does not provide. I'm here looking for resources. Oh my gosh. I, I was new in the organization then. I didn't understand that. He was a wonderful, valued member for at least a decade after that. I lost touch with him after a while. Um, 
but he was there for many, many years making great referrals. And so, yeah, Dave, I tell people, it's two, people come for one of two businesses, two reasons, give or get business. The give business is finding resources. When I say lead with giving, when I say come to a group to give, that's looking for resources for my clients. I got a client who's got a wonderful company. I got their IP sewn up, but they need a real estate lawyer. They need a corporate lawyer. Maybe they need an accountant. Maybe they need a better insurance broker. I make those referrals literally every single day. Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. Haven't made one yet today. We'll see. But the bottom line is that I make those referrals because those resources are incredible. Providers is an incredible network of people. And you talked about those 10 or 12 or 20 people that people talk about. Many of us know people all over the country who do all kinds of things. And we check in with each other. And we, when, we don't, when we don't know the right person immediately, we'll reach out to a handful of people. Who do you, And then someone will know. That's why they call it a network. The network is the connections of all the different people who know one another. The, the group leader of the Boston Lawyers Group who's a good friend, Chris Murphy, one day asked me for a divorce lawyer in Seattle. I got him three within an hour and a half. Then one day on a Saturday... He, and I was at my group's social at somebody's house. He asked me he needed a trusted estates lawyer in Las Vegas. I had two for him by the time dinner was over. Finding reach, finding people in different cities and different countries and different disciplines, that's what a network does for you. You can be as great as you want, but if you're only you, your clients will have needs that you cannot fulfill. If you can provide services for others, you can provide resources for others. If you can provide connections for others, you're going to be the person people want to call. You're going to be the person people want to keep top of mind for asking for referrals. And let me tell you something. That has helped me become better known than anything else. Better than my wine dinners. Better than my really good IP skills. Thank you very much for showcasing some of those earlier today. What's, what's really kept me top of people's mind is that I've got great reach and I'm willing to spend the time and effort to find the right referral for you. And people come to me for that. As long as they're coming to me, Dave, I don't care what they're coming for. Money will go in my pocket eventually. But it doesn't need to be today. It doesn't need to be this year. It doesn't need to even be this decade. Eventually, when you think of me over and over and over again, one day you're going to need a patent, trademark, or copyright lawyer. So I don't care why I'm helping you. I don't care what I'm helping you with. As long as you're coming to me for help, I got you. I know mortgage brokers who do that. I know coaches who do that. I know amazingly incredible lawyers and accountants and insurance brokers who do that because that's what a network is all about. And that's what you're great at, by the way. That's what I'm great at. And yeah, that's why you and I are going to succeed because it's not that we're looking to take. It's that we're looking to give. We're looking to make it better for others. We're looking to provide resources. And that will build our network so that eventually people can't help but come to us. All right, that's perfect explanation. The last thing I want to talk to you about when it comes to groups, specifically provisors, is competitors. I have this attitude that, look, I know what my capabilities are. I can only take on so many new clients in a year, and there are a bazillion out there in the world. So I am happy to be in a room with other people who do what I do and let the market sort it out because if it's if it's not a good fit, if the person's not a good fit for me, I want to I want to keep it in the family. I want I want it to be a good fit for somebody else that I'm going to see on a regular basis. There are so many people who I've found, especially people who are newer to an organization like the one we belong to, that are that are you know they're 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 closed fisted and they're so concerned about oh it's but this, fine, is, my slot. Go this away. is my slot. Listen. I, I'm not running a group. If you want to be in a peop, a group of people that are like-minded lawyers, go, go work with Steve Fretzen. He's the guy for that, right? I'm the guy who's going to help you go from six figures to seven. I'm going to customize the business development approach for you. It's going to be a very intimate experience. If that's what you're looking for, I'm a better fit for that. But if you want a group, Fretzen's got great groups and he's great at running them. You should be in Fretzen's group. If you want both, join both. That would be amazing. Why is it so hard to break through, Mark? What what has been how how do you counsel members of your groups or people who come to you for advice when they have this competition issue? Fear and ignorance, Dave. Fear and ignorance. And here's how that goes. 
my group, Irvine 3, the one that I'm... I'm only group leader of one group. People think I'm group leader of like 10 groups because I just act that way, but I'm only group leader of one group. My group is hosted at Kenobi, Martins, Olsen, and Bear, the largest and maybe best patent firm in the world. And they have about 300 people who do what I do. Yeah, they got some trademark specialists who don't do patents. Patent specialists don't do trademark. I told you, I'm broader based. I'm really, But they've got some real specialists, and I actually rely on them for when my clients need something that I can't do well or they can do better. They're a great firm. But there's 300 of them. They don't view each other as competitors. Why would I view them as competitors, and why would they view me as a competitor? Let me tell you, when their clients can no longer afford them, they send them to me. I remember when I was at the big firm and Kenobi Martins was this little sleepy, low-cost alternative that things have changed. But at the end of the day, we can think of each other. There's no competition in provisors. Now, there's an old term. It's been around for a long time. Brad Leggett brought it to our attention, cooperation. Brad Leggett's a coach. He's a sales coach. And he brought it to Harold Weitzberg in a little mastermind group they used to have. Maybe they still do. I don't know. And Harold Weitzberg, who is in my Irvine 3 group, brought it to Blip, Branding, Licensing, Intellectual Property, where Janice Miller heard it. And then she went and wrote a book called Cooperation. Well, Cooperation has been around a long time. And I didn't, before I ever heard the term, I just said abundance mindset. I called it Noah's Ark. And my group leader, Sajar Rauf, calls it Noah's Mark because I've done it, I've perfected it, and I've put it into Sajar's group and Jennifer Oliver's San Diego group. And any group that will listen to me, overlap, redundancy, have two of everything except what you have three of. You have one coach, have two coaches. One patent lawyer, have two patent lawyers. One employment lawyer, have three, why not? Three divorce lawyers. Let people choose, as you say. Let the free market control, as you say. But here's the thing, Dave. It's more than let the free market control. It's more than giving people's options. Because I can give you options from seven different groups. They don't need to be in the same group. Here's the key to it, Dave. This is what people don't really quite understand. I know you do, but people don't quite understand it. That abundance mindset not just gives others a choice, but it lets two of us in a similar space with our Venn diagram have overlap and our sweet spots outside it. And we'll refer into one another's sweet spots, which builds the pie bigger for both of us. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not a give to get. But the whole idea is that not everything's perfect for me and it may be for you. And I will know your space if you're an IP lawyer way better than, no, no offense Dave, than you will or Fretzen will or some other coach or some other insurance broker or some other accountant. A IP lawyer is going to know another IP lawyer's space better. And you and Fretzen and Carol Barzook and Christopher King, you're going to all know each other better than us non-coaches. And that's why the coaches and consultants group that Greg Collins runs in Boston is so fantastic. I've been there in person. I've been there on Zoom. It's a great group. I've sent dozens of people there because it's a great place for people to really understand each other's sweet spots and refer to those sweet spots. Same thing with Harold Whitesburg's branding, licensing, and intellectual property. And Cindy Hazel's branding, licensing, and intellectual property called BAMS, Bay Area Marketing Sales, or Bliss, whatever you want to call it, up in the Bay Area. You get people in a room who do similar things, and they find those sweet spots amongst one another, and they can refer into them and build the pie bigger for everybody. High tide raises all boats. And I would way, way prefer to have a small sliver of a huge pie than an enormous piece of a tiny pie. And when people understand that this hoarding mentality is so terrible and it's guaranteed to make sure you starve, and the abundance mindset, the cooperation, the ability to come in here and say, hey, you know what? I want you in the room. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not going to shy away from you. I'm going to embrace you. I'm going to come up and get to know you. It's why Gary Eastman and I are in the group together. It's why Brian Clausen and I are in the group together. It's why I seek out other IP lawyers like Dana Cotman and Cara, Karen Hawks, where my good friends, Tony Laurentano, and, and, and um, many, many other IP lawyers across the country. Why we're friends, why we trust each other and like each other and refer to each other is because we embrace the fact that there's multiple people in a space and it's not always a good fit for everybody. And by the way, there's way more work outside provisors than there ever will be inside provisors. So none of us have to have a scarcity mindset. None of us have to be worried that we're not going to get that client because there's 10 more down the road. And so your mind is the most powerful thing. That fear, that ignorance, it's limiting, it's self-limiting behaviors. It's please, please, please don't compete with me. If you, if there's anybody else in the room who does what I do, I won't get the work. Oh my God. How about this? Let's have 10 people like me in the room. Because all of a sudden, you know, Dave, I used to represent International Coffee, Bean, and Tea Leaf. 
In fact, I put together the license agreement that led to the sale from a family-owned business to a, an international business guy, Sonny Sassoon, who was an Iraqi Jew from Singapore, who ended up buying it because he couldn't get out of my license agreement termination clause. That's not a patting myself on the back. That's just my way of saying I knew International Coffee Bean really well. And I was talking with the vice president one day, and I said, you know, in my neighborhood, I, I noticed that, you know, you guys were there and Starbucks just opened up across the street. Doesn't that piss you off? He goes, oh, Mark, we love it. Look, what? What? We love it. When Starbucks and, and Coffee Bean are across the street from each other, we want a Pete's there. It makes it a coffee corner. People come there for coffee, and maybe one person wants one, the other, and they can all have what they want. It's why food courts and malls exist, and why in food courts and malls, sometimes the same franchisee owns multiple, they'll own the Kansas, the, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken, they'll own the barbecue place, they'll own the, the Sabika Italian. They'll own those places because they know it's a place where people come to do commerce. Real business people understand that when you put people in a room that are similar, more business gets done, not less. When you have competitors in the room, it's cooperation. It's not losing business. Don't be afraid. Don't be ignorant. Have the abundance mindset. And Dave, the world is your oyster and sky is the limit. There's not enough work to, that you can do if you have the right mindset. It's that simple. That was perfect. Thank you so much for describing it that way. All right, Mark, I want you to think of three things that people should take away from our time together today. Three things. I'm going to give you a minute to do that because I'm going to do a, a quick commercial. Uh, folks heard about Sandrowski Corporate Advisors earlier in the show. We have a Sandrowski Business Minute that we play in the beginning of the show. Right now, I want to let you know about my revenue roadmap guide. So you're looking to develop business just like Mark Hankin said, you're looking to build your business using uh, relationship-based business development. You need a plan. You can't just go off willy-nilly and try and figure this out on your own. I want to give my plan to you for free. This is the same plan I use with my clients. I customize it for them. You can customize it for yourself. Here's how you're going to do it. You're going to go to revenueroadmapguide.com. That's a website, revenueroadmapguide.com. Put all those words in together, no spaces, the .com at the end. Enter your contact info. When you enter your contact info, you're going to be able to download that business development plan for yourself and for your professional firm. And then you can customize it so that you can use relationship-based business development strategies in order to grow your firm. We help you with networking. We help you with speaking. We help you with publishing. The plan will walk you through it step-by-step. -step. RevenueRoadmapGuide.com. That is my gift to you for watching and listening to the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us today. If you want to get in touch with Mark, here's how you can do it. You can reach out to Mark through... His website, which is hankinpatentlaw.com. I'm going to put that down in the show notes, hankinpatentlaw.com. Also, you can email him. His email is down in the show notes as well. You can call his office. He loves phone calls. We still have phones, folks. They still work. 310-979-3600, 310-979-3600. And he can work on intellectual property matters all over the United States. He helps international. He helps foreign clients register their patents here in the U.S. He can also do intellectual property work anywhere in the United States. And if you are a trial attorney and you have a patent matter and you're thinking about going to court and representing your client, don't commit malpractice. Call Mark. Let him co-counsel the case with you so that you actually have a chance of winning. I know you think you're going to win anyway, but you're not. You need to call Mark. You need to get Mark on your team so that you know what you're doing when it comes to doing patent work. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen smart people go down in flames because they try and do patent litigation. It's not probate litigation, folks. It's not complex commercial litigation. It's patent litigation. You need to have somebody who knows what they're doing on your team. Give Mark a call. All right, Mark, what are the three things we should take away from our time together today? I'm going to start with where we ended, abundance mindset. Recognize that the more you come to give, the bigger the pie grows. Don't shy away from your competitors. Number two, we do business with people we like. So you know what you need to do? You need to be likable. Be a good person. Think of others first. Go out of your way to help them. Always take the call. Always return the email promptly. Help people when they ask for it. And then number three, it's kind of what you just said. You need a specialist, whether it's a patent litigator or licensor like me, whether it's an incredible godfather of growth coach like you, whether it's an insurance person who really understands personal lines compared to 
uh, commercial liability, whether it's an accountant who understands techno you know, uh, doing technology audits or somebody who does uh, forensic accounting for, for divorces. There's lots of specialists in the world. Don't try to do it alone. Don't get a generalist. Find a specialist. There's lots of them out there. And yes, co-counsel with them. Join up with them. Pair up with them. But don't be afraid to get the specialized advice you need. Life's pretty complicated, and there are specialists, and Provisors has a lot of them. And if not, we all know lots of people outside Provisors we can refer in. So those are my three tips. Dave, this has been a great interview. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thanks so much for teasing so much information out of me. It's fantastic. No, you were fantastic. You were a wealth of information on a number of topics, folks. You need to reach out to Mark Hankin. You can call him 310-979-3600. 310-979-3600. His information is down in the show notes. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an honor to have you on. Dave, thank you so much. Take care. Have a great day. Alrighty, folks, that'll do it for another episode of the Inside BS Show. I'm Dave Lorenzo. We'll be back here again tomorrow with another great interview. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.